Okay, good. So if you're on Facebook and YouTube, you're seeing a blank screen, and we're going to be starting in about one minute. <coughs> as soon as John gives me the go-ahead, <laughs> then I tell people we're not going to talk about things because we now have a ministry of disinformation. Which I know, wait, no, don't say it. They, this, this administration is full of disinformation. Okay, I know that. No, no, no. They're going to judge other people's disinformation, not their own. The Ministry of Truth. No, that's 1984. <laughs> this is the, well, we're going to bring it up in the censored part. Okay. Which, because you can't talk about it regular. Because they haven't approved it. You know, it's like Hunter Biden's laptop is disinformation, but now it's real. Yeah. The Voldemort virus is just as bad as the flu, only it's not, but now it is. <laughs>Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Okay, now, regenerative medicine. This is something you hear all the time. We're going to talk about how to regenerate. But the weird thing is, medicine is stupid. Okay, you're not going to regenerate by taking a patentable chemical inside of your body. Your body is self-regenerating, self-healing. So we're going to talk about how to regenerate hips, because that's the biggest one. I got this quote, and I, I couldn't figure out where it came from. Uh, what we learn from studying history is that we do not learn from studying history. <laughs> okay, history repeats itself. Okay, but, you know, some of us do learn. Now, um, it, it'll be uninterrupted because there is a censorship board now in, in America. I, what was that first? Um, Bill of Rights, freedom of what? Speech? Okay, no, <laughs> I get confused. Okay, so so... That's why we have the Dr. BVIP, okay? You get on there, you're going to watch this continuously. Get the information and share it. Those of you who are supporting us, God bless you. It's really appreciated because we do at least two to three videos a week. Um, our apprenticeship program started last month. It's the last Thursday of every month, and we're, I'm going to be training everybody this because society is changing. I was going to say breaking down, but the more you know how your body works, you could want to empower people to fix yourself, fix your families, and the more you know about anatomy, physiology, neurology, this is all the stuff that we should be taught in schools, not um, you know, the color of your skin. Extreme, uh, Extreme Health Academy, um, I totally recommend you, you looking into this, uh, do the Dr. B, um, I think it's uh, Dr. B is you get two weeks for free, but you're looking at this and there's so many people who have had health challenges and recovered. So now you might be wondering, how come joints are breaking down? How come, you know, because you hear the BS from the doctors that it's, it's just, it's wearing out. No, you go to any medical doctor, and I'm talking the standard ones, not, not the exceptional ones like Deepak Chopra, okay? Um, what are you going to get if you have a symptom? Are you going to get diet information, biomechanic information, um, education on what your body's doing, or are you going to get a pill, potion, or lotion? That's it. So 50 years of a pharmaceutical approach to health. Now, this is regulatory capture. In this book, The Real Anthony Fauci, you will find out why America is one of the, we spend the most per capita per person on healthcare, and we have, we're the last place of any industrialized nation because there is no alternative, okay? In fact, they're censoring alternative, and it's only a pharmaceutical approach. And Mr. Kennedy, I mean, wrote it down in this book, and it is referenced. Buy it, share it, and we've got extra copies here that we, that we pass out in our lending library. So let's look at hips because I'm getting a lot of people with hip damage. And there's three causes of this, okay? And you'll notice none of it's genetic, right? Okay, yeah, okay, three causes. Neurogenic, that means you've got compromised nerve supply to the hip or altering the gait. Vascular, that means your blood isn't healthy or you've got compromised blood supply to it. Or mechanical, that means a direct trauma. Now, now think of this, where could the trauma be? 
Okay, for one, you know what? I'm gonna do something I've never done before. I gotta go off camera and get a spine. Okay, I totally forgot. God, how do you like that? <laughs> Normally I have the props here, okay? So what we're looking at is the hip joint. Now this hip is connected to the pelvis. Now this, what you're looking at, when you look at that picture in the middle, it kind of looks like you've got um, a, a femur coming up and a roof like that. That's not what you're seeing. And this is frustrating because mm -hmm. A lot of doctors will say it's bone on bone. And I'm telling you right now, I've worked on thousands and thousands and thousands of patients with bad hips, and I've never seen one bone on bone, ever. Because when you're looking at this, you're actually not seeing what you're seeing on that where you have the bone coming up and like that. Oop, I just covered the microphone, sorry. What you're doing, you're looking through this front part, you're looking through the back part, and since the top part's really wide, you're only seeing this. And I'm gonna show you how to look through the joint in order to see the structure of that joint. Now, this one here is a somewhat normal joint. We have the femur coming in, it looks round, and the acetabulum where it goes into looks like it's, like it's got an even keel around it or an even spacing. But look at the other picture. The, the little picture on the left-hand side there. It's a capsule, so this is a hydraulic joint. And then in that capsule is the synovial fluid, so it's always got liquid in there, so it's got cushion. So you might think, wow, if you don't have the hydraulics in there, if you don't have the fluid, it's gonna create some inflammation, it's gonna create some kind of damage. So does that mean that if your blood isn't healthy, you're gonna have unhealthy joints? Yes or yes? Also, I want you to look at the ligaments because that capsule that goes around the whole thing in that cutaway version is also attached to the bone. In this capsule, you're gonna actually start to see it turn into bone. Now, a lot of ignorant physicians will say it's calcific deposits. The body's not gonna lay down calcium just for random, you know? And, and if some doctor says, well, it's calcium deposits, okay, gee, why is the body laying down calcium, doc? Okay, wouldn't that be a nice question? No, this is ossification. It's literally, if there's less fluid in that joint, then, the, then the, the ligament that's only supposed to hold fluid in there is used beyond its structural limit or beyond its design. So the body, instead of replacing the amino acids to form that cartilage and the ligamentous tissue in that capsule, it turns it into bone. And that's what you'll see. You'll see actually called bone spurs coming out along that ligamentous ac action. So when this structure starts to not function correctly, there's three causes, nerve supply, blood supply, or mechanics. That's it, that's it. So to get it corrected, you gotta do the same thing. Now, when you're looking at the hips that look like degenerated, okay, that's because there's less hydraulics in there, and so there's not the cushion. So the bone can distort, the cartilage can distort, and the capsule can distort. So everything in there. So it's really from either trauma or compromised blood supply, nerve supply, or mechanics. Now, joints do not wear out. Joints do not wear out. Joints do not wear out. Did I, did I just say that? Okay, good, I just wanna make sure. Because this is crazy, okay? I mean, I've got patients. And I'm talking professional athletes. One of, one of our patients, five Super Bowl rings. He's in his 60s, jogs every day. Friggin' phenomenal, phenomenal shape. But he was a running back. So you're talking multiple, multiple hits. His joints are perfect. Okay, perfect. Joints do not wear out. But what happens is if you're using them and you have compromised blood supply, nerve supply, or alter mechanics, then they have to adapt to that stress environment. So these are adaptations, not degeneration. Adaptations to stress. And this is why a lot of hip replacements don't work because they're not fixing the pelvis. They're not fixing all the other, in, the other structures that are intimidated. Because if you've got a hip problem, is your gait going to be good or is it going to be off a little bit? 
So is this going to maybe screw up the knees? Is it going to screw up the feet? Is it going to screw up everything else? So you've got to look at the entire body. If you've got a hip problem, hip damage, it's not just the hip. It never is. Although I did sell that to, to one doc I was talking to. We're setting up a teaching thing in Thailand last night. And I said, you know, just take hips, for instance, you know, because he's asking, you know, how we're going to present this material because it's really different to, for medical doctors to understand. And we've got to do it in a different language. And I said, look, doc, you know, you're never going to have some patient laying comfortably in bed and his girlfriend comes up with a baseball bat and just beats him in the hip. And he tells me a story about a buddy of his. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, okay, that's a story. <laughs> so you've got to look at this. But now look at the, the, the supposed degenerated hips. You had to have altered mechanics. They do not wear out if you have the appropriate nerve supply and blood supply. And this right here is criminal. Um, you're looking at the left hip over there on the right-hand side of the film. You've got a perfectly formed head of that femur. You have a little less space. So what does that mean? That means that you have compromised fluid production in there. So that means either stress for the blood being, being you know, thick, because under stress the blood increases its viscosity, or you have altered mechanics or something. Now I want you to look at the lumbar spine where it says before. See how the spine goes up and then bends off to the side? Now the nerves that supply the hip come out of L2, the second one, and that's right at the apex of that bend. So we know there's compromised nerve supply. Does that mean the entire structure could be off? Yeah. And you're looking at the glutes because like if I stand on one leg, that means the opposite side. So if you're standing on just your left leg, that means that right glute has got to be tight as all heck because otherwise you'd fall over. So the main hip stabilizer for the opposite side, okay, is the gluteus medius. So if you have a hip problem, guess what? Your whole body weight is going to shift away from that, okay? And that's going to change the mechanics. It's going to tighten up the muscles around it so that'll limit motion. And that fluid flows in there through motion. And this is why, and, and this is every joint, think of every joint in your body. When you're not moving it, okay, you're sitting at a desk or sitting in a plane, because I was sitting in a plane flying to North Dakota this past week, okay, what's it like to stand up after you've been sitting for three hours? You just bounce right out, don't you? Or is it like, oh, Ken, oh, oh, okay, yeah, because if you don't move a joint, you get less fluid flowing into it, you get less synovial fluid production. You move a joint, you start to lubricate it. Okay, it's really that simple. So this hip compression could have come from a twisted ankle. It could have come from a fall because we know L2 supplies it and that's right where the bend in is in the low back. So we know there's compromised nerve supply. What was that trauma that caused that bend in the spine there? I don't know. Okay, but it was something. Do you think that she's just laying in bed and somebody hit her with a baseball bat in the back? Yes, I know it's possible. <laughs> I now know it's possible after talking to that doctor. But this is also why we use a foam piece. And this, you can use an Ikea water bottle, anything around four, four and a half inches in diameter. And where this is placed is the bottom of the elbow is the bottom of the roll. And this is to turn sitting into therapy. Why? Because when you place this foam piece up here, when you're sitting, you're sitting on this butt bone here, it forces the curve in that low back. And so that creates a negative pressure on the front and it's placed right at that junction of the rib cage and low back. And that happens to be the area that supplies the hip. I mean, it's fantastic. 20 minutes in, 10 minutes out, because that's what it takes. So I'm running a rough overview just to show you some of this stuff. But now let's look at the crazy world. And <laughs> no, I'm not talking CNN. Okay, um, hip replacements. So we're looking at a 224% increase in 10 years. Now this was 12 years ago. And let me tell you, it's gone up. But I could not find statistics anything newer than 2015. I mean, it was, it's crazy. I think everybody's gone COVID nuts. Um, now this, so what's going on? So you're looking in 10 years, a 200% increase. And I'm gonna show you some stats in a minute, three 350% increase in hip replacements. 
are hips just wearing out faster? Okay, so the Health, Health Daily News looked into it, or actually U.S. Natural Center for Health Statistics. The main hypothesis is that osteoarthritis is becoming more common, but the statistics in the study don't reveal why the procedures are taking place. Osteoarthritis, arth means joint, itis means inflammation. Osteoarthritis is from a trauma. What are the three things that cause hip damage? Altered nerve supply, blood supply, or actual trauma, mechanical trauma. That's what osteoarthritis is. So if you have a trauma, you've just got something knocked out of place, guess how you a chiropractor fix it? You put it back in place. I know, I know. Wow, I never thought of that. That seems so simple, and it is. It really is. Most hip replacements are in middle-aged patients due to degenerative arthritis caused by wear and tear. That is a friggin' lie. When you say osteoarthritis, that is not wear and tear. That is from a trauma. And then the idiots go in and say it's from wear and tear. Do you want to know why it's from wear and tear? I'm going to tell you in a second. So 2004, 37% increase in hip replacements. Knee replacements, 53% increase. So now that's in 2004. Go forward 11 years. 265% increase in hip replacements, 324% in knee replacements. So why, why, why are human joints wearing out? Since we know it's trauma, that's what osteoarthritis is, it's a trauma. It's not, it's called degenerative joint disease, it's also called degenerative disc disease, and they know it's from a trauma, and that, that's it. Hip failures, now these things don't last near as long as joints. Okay, your joints last 120 years. They're always replacing themselves. Okay, these things last 10 to 15 years, tops, and then they have a foreign object in there, so it creates inflammation, so it damages your entire health. Um, total revision. Revision is kind of like saying if a, um, if a vaccine totally fails, you don't want to say vaccine failure. What do you say? You say breakthrough. Yeah, baby, that's politics, okay? So you don't say failed hip surgery, you say revision, okay? Don't you love that? It's, it's just so politics. Um, but morbidity increases two to threefold higher risk of dying during uh, complications of removing the old hip and, or the, the old new hip and putting in the new new hip, okay? Now... Um, no national registry for joint. Well, well, that's kind of true, but kind of not. There is some registry for, for hip replacements. But it's interesting. These observations highlight the urgent need for population-based studies to define the failure rate leading to revision. I'll show you the failure rate and what it's from. This is orthoinfo.com. This is one of the best, most definitive um, research things for patients so that you can communicate to your doctors. Okay, and it shows, remember, 50 years of pharmaceutically controlled education, 50 years of pharmaceutically controlled, and not they're not teaching more anatomy, physiology, or neurology. They're, the orthopedic guy isn't looking at blood viscosity knowing that all the joints are hydraulic. They're not taught that. They're not taught that, that um, the hip joint is connected to altered mechanics of the knee, the foot, the back. They're not looking at the spine. They're not looking at any of that. So what do you do? I pulled up hip bursitis. Now, all tendons, all tendons, now these are muscles. They attach to bones via tendons. Around each tendon is a bursa sac because the more you move it, the more friction occurs. And those bursa sacs are filled with bursa fluid. So that's why, uh, so bursitis means inflammation of those, and that means lack of fluid to the bursa sacs. So what we recommend if you have bursitis of the wrist, elbow, or shoulder, it's from the neck, the blood supply. Okay, if you have bursitis in the legs, like hip, knee, foot, it's from the blood supply. Is that complicated? No, how do you increase blood supply? Put some heat on it, but then fix the problem. Okay, find the problem and fix it. So we're talking basic common sense. Let's see what these guys think. Okay, um, act, uh, activity modification. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Okay, don't do that. Yeah. Okay, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, naproxen, priocam, Celebrex, others, okay. 
Um, what do they say about this? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories may have side effects if you have certain medical conditions or take certain medications. You're going to find out these medications, the non-steroidals, destroy the building block of cartilage. Okay? Inflammation is how the body heals. This stops that healing process of the body. This is one of the reasons it destroys the cartilage. Yeah, I know your hip hurts and this will make you feel a lot better, but it's going to be pretty bad for you. Okay, assistive devices, of course, a cane or crutch. Physical therapy, okay, rolling massage, stretch the muscles, heat, ultrasound. Now, you could see altered mechanics. I've got a physical therapist that, that works with She is brilliant in Mexico, brilliant. I love the heck out of her. Now, steroid injections, that's interesting. That's another anti-inflammatory. Now, what does it do? It's important to limit the number of injections as prolonged corticosteroid injections may damage surrounding tissue. It destroys the joints. So their advice, out of the five things they recommend, two of the five, okay, damage the joints. And this is the doctor. <laughs> it's like, I mean, the American Journal of Medicine, what country is that from? Oh, America, okay. It, Tylenol and non decrease cartilage production, inhibit the building product of cartilage, causes accelerated bone destruction. Is this something you want to take to alleviate discomfort? Um, psychiatric effects, asthma risk, um, toxic epidermal necrosis, skin disorders, blood cancer, twofold increase in blood cancer. But wait a second, didn't we say all the joints in the body are hydraulic? Yeah, we're, I mean, you know, we're talking the knee or the, the hip. Now, the sacral iliac joint, that's why I should have gotten this prop earlier. This joint back here, now there's no muscle that crosses the back half of this one in this joint, okay? So it's a perfect joint. But if you have an altered mechanics where you're walking a little crooked, that joint can become unstable. And then you're not designed to sit. You're actually designed to move, bend, turn, twist. But you're sitting on this. This is the butt bone. That's the ischial tube. Okay, and if you're sitting on that, so people, truck drivers, airline pilots, um, office workers, that can destabilize this sacral iliac joint. If you have an old hip trauma, like let's say you twisted an ankle and that was never corrected and you walked like this for a month, is that going to change the force loading on a hip? Yeah. That's why when people come in, and they say, my hip hurts, we look at everything. I look at bunion formation, we look at knee function, we look at, and I ask how their bowel movements are working. Why would I say if somebody has a hip and a bunion formation, why would I ask about bowel formation? Because of this. Half of the autonomic nervous system that, that does resting, digesting, and repair is located here in the pelvis. The other half is located up here at the base of the brain. So you have the parasympathetic nervous system that's responsible for a digestion. A tissue production is located here in the sacrum and here in the skull. Okay, well, a little oblong section that extends down in there called the medulla. So this governs the automatic function of your body. So if you have a hip issue, does that help destabilize the pelvis? Absolutely. So you can't look at a hip problem as a hip problem. There's going to be poor sleep patterns. You're going to be getting up to urinate. There could be bowel and bladder dysfunction. There could be a lot of stuff. And, and you know, they come in for hip issues. No, but I have a gastroenterologist. Oh, I know what that guy's going to do. He's going to give you some medications. Oh, I have a, a psychiatrist. I know what he's going to do. He's going to give medications. You know, get, why? Because it's a pharmaceutical controlled world. The nervous system controls every function of the body. The nerves that supply the hip come out of the second lumbar nerve that's right next to the, the junction of the rib cage and low back. But people will tell you, and this is hugely important, I've got so many patients that say, it's my hip, it hurts like this. And they'll take their hand and run it down, okay? Hip pain from the hip doesn't radiate down. It's local in that area. So when people say, it hurts right here, doc, and going right here like this, down, okay, on the inside of the leg, I say, I know exactly where that is. That's L2, that's right at the junction of the thoracic. And no, 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 my doctor says it's the hip. 
They took an x-ray of the hip. They said it's the hip, but it hurts like this. Okay, it can't be that. Hip joint pain does not radiate from the hip. Joints of the nerves, and that's why you see those lines coming off, those are called dermatomal, uh, where an area of skin is supplied by a specific nerve root. So that's a problem with the spine. Hip pain will only be in the hip, okay? So make sure you look at the location of it, as I guarantee you, your medical doctor isn't. Now, piriformis syndrome, this is one of the muscles that crosses the front part of it. It turns the leg, it's a rotator, um, but if you have pelvic dysfunction, that muscle's gonna be tight. So if you have piriformis syndrome, understand it's an unstable pelvis. Could that also be a contributing factor to the hip? Absolutely. Now, uh, there's some conditions where the sciatic nerve, and sciatic nerve is huge. It's the diameter of your index finger, and it's so thick and strong that if you have a cadaver, you could pick up the whole cadaver. It feels, feels just like an electric cord. It's amazing. Now, there's some times where that sciatic nerve can grow through the piriformis, so there could be some fibers there. Uh, but you're not going to be, and this is what I've seen so many times, professional athletes that had an MRI that show that. So these guys are high-level, college-level, professional athletes, and they said, yeah, the reason I have the sciatic nerve is because it goes through the piriformis. And I said, no, that's something that happened your entire life, but it hasn't bugged you until, you know, last year. Okay, you know what I mean? So it's, it's not going to all of a sudden grow through that or the piriformis is going to grow around it. So piriformis syndrome, if anyone says syndrome, know that they probably don't know really what the heck they're talking about. Um, the pelvic floor muscles, this is huge. Now this is, um, this has got a hard metal thing coming out through it, but it should be, it's, it's like a trampoline. Now when you're standing, walking, or sitting, all your organs are pushing down in there. There's, it's called mesentery. Now that's creating a floor. Now if you're sitting on the ischial tubes here, that, that muscle can expand out and weaken. And this is also why pelvic dysfunction alters bowel and bladder control. I mean, you also have the sacral plexus here, a bunch of nerves that are here that control the pelvic floor. In fact, the, the mnemonic is S2, S3, S4, keeps the ding-dong off the floor. <coughs> Look, the dirtier the, the mnemonic, the better people remember it, okay? You know, I'm just saying that that's the pelvic floor. So if there is a pelvic dysfunction from a hip problem, that pelvic floor can also be an issue. So look at bowel and bladder control. Like when, when I see, you know, these, um, you know these, these commercials that say, well, I used to leak a lot, but now I have these Depends. You know, it's like, God, look at the problem. You know, you're not supposed to do it. And there, there's a joke that I can't say right now, but it was... It involves that, and it involves a, a leader of a country. <laughs> you know, boxers or briefs, which you prefer? Well, it depends. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, so we, the floor of that pelvis has to be tightened up, and this is where the Kegel exercises work. But if you have a pelvic problem, how do you know? Well, look at, look at the variety of symptoms you can have with that pelvis. And when we're talking hip dysfunction, you've got to look at the pelvis. Sciatic nerve, pain when sitting, bladder control, sexual dysfunction, leg pain, walking pain, foot pain, knee pain. And, and what, what are some of the problems? Long-term low back pain, okay? Prolonged sitting, pregnancy. Medications can weaken that. We just showed you that Advil, Tylenol, Motrin, non anti-inflammatory, steroids, okay, that'll screw it up lack of movement, because you need movement in order to keep healthy joints. Now, Kegel exercises, if you're getting, because when we're looking at the hip, there's always going to be secondary discs in the lumbar that you've got to address. You've got to stabilize the hip. That's why we use those trochanter supports. Um, but the Kegel exercises, now this is, it's cruel to tell someone to do a Kegel exercise if they have compromised nerve supply from the low back or pelvic area. So we don't give the Kegel exercises for at least the first week. But what you do is, when you're urinating, okay, and how many guys in here have written their name in the sand? Okay, or snow, <laughs> or anything, okay? I mean, this is, this is how I taught my kids how to pee outside, okay? You know, hold it, buddy, then we could go out, you know? Okay, the, the muscles that you use to stop that urine flow 
okay, is the Kegel exercise. So I'm going to do it right here, right in front of you. We're going to hold it for five seconds. Ready? One, two, three, four. Hold it. One, two, three, four, five. And then relax. Okay. Hold it. One, two, three, four, five. Then relax. And you do that 10 times, um, at least five sets a day, and you're going to start to strengthen that. But it actually helps the pelvic floor. But you have, a, have to have a good, um, a good nerve supply to it. So better urine control, can control premature ejaculation, sensation, stimulate blood flow. I mean, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The pelvis, trochanter supports, and this is the biggest complaint that I get when, I, when chiropractors you know, talk to me. Well, you know, I got a patient that drives far, and I said, I got patients that fly far. Okay, you know, I'll adjust them, and by the time they get home, they still hurt. Okay, yeah, because you're not fixing the problem. A pelvic adjustment is so much fun for a chiropractor because you can get in there, it's big, it's nice, it's easy to get a hold of, you go bam, it pops, everybody feels good, but then by the time they get home, they're uncomfortable again. That's because there's no muscle that crosses the back half of this joint. And this is one of the primary things that I teach other chiropractors. Stabilize the pelvis, find out what the problem is. Okay, you may have to change the gait, you may have to change the feet, you may have to do anything, but get a trochanter support on that. While you're addressing the disc injuries, and the only way you can identify a disc is through a standing weight-bearing stress x-ray. When you bend off to the side, it should be curved. You should have narrow discs on the concavity, wide disc on the convexity. Bend the other way. If you see something bending the opposite direction, that's going to be a disc dysfunction. Uh, so. It, you know, all the chiropractors that, you know, are pre, do pre and post x-rays, they're going to be able to identify it. But also, you can sit backwards like a cowboy or a cowgirl, okay? And this means you take the chair around, sit bound backwards. You know, just think of every Western, you know, when the, the badass cowboy comes up, turns the chair around, and then sits down backwards, because that will use the legs to approximate the, the pelvis. So all of these things are to stabilize the pelvis, but you've got to use something to turn sitting into therapy to get it to work correctly. <clears throat> so S muscles. Now this goes on the front of the vertebrae down and it's one of the hip flexors. So if you've been diagnosed with a hip flexor problem, guess what? It's not the muscle, okay? It's not, it could be tight. It's gonna be tight for a reason. Okay, it could be altered gait. It could be sitting too long where that muscle is shortened. If you're sitting too long and both of them are tight, you're gonna have to get exercises to move it, not just to stretch that, because there's gonna be a lot of other problems there. Um, but here we go, and this is kind of interesting. See that red arrow there? What you're looking at is the femur is not round. The femur is actually distorted to match that socket. And this is what I see probably 30, 35% of the time in everybody, whether they have hip problems or not. The hips, and I mean, if you're Carl Lewis or some you know, super athlete, you're gonna have perfectly formed hips because you're doing things that are amazing. You know, if you're Barishnikov, oh my gosh, you know, you, you can do incredible stuff. But a lot of people will have distortions. And what you'll see, and it's kind of hard to see from, from way back there, um, you're gonna see that there's a little, like a little lip coming off of this, coming out, going like that. That's the body laying down extra bone to put more stability in that. And one of the, the, one of the training things that we have for our doctors, I show them how to look at an x-ray. So that, that growth there takes three to five years to see a small bone change on x-ray. You're looking at three eighths to half an inch there. That's 20 years. So if you see a hip that's distorted with 20 years of bone growth, and she comes in and says, yeah, it's been hurting for a year. Okay, what, okay, think of it. 20 years of bone growth, it's been hurting for a year. Now a doctor will look at this and say, well, yeah, it's all distorted. No, that distortion was to adapt to a, a socket that wasn't formed correctly. So this is the body working. So you've got, to, you've got to change that mindset. If the doctor just is expecting to see normal 
And if he doesn't see normal, he's going to cut that sucker out and put a new one in that has a lot of complications. Or if he's going to suggest a toxic chemical or shots that destroy the joint, find another doctor. Okay, it's, it's going to be pretty simple. But again, you can see the before and after. Look at the after. She still has, you know, an alteration right at the junction of the rib cage. You're always going to see that, that kind of nerve supply, blood supply, um, biomechanic problem. Another patient here. And you can see it looks like there's no space. But remember, you're not looking at a bone coming in. You're looking through this back part, you're looking through this front part, and you're only seeing the top part because it's super thick, okay? So now, if you have an altered mechanic in there in a desiccated up or dried up joint, that bone, that hip, that femur is gonna be slamming into these. And if you irritate bone, bone gets thicker, okay? It gets stronger. If you break a bone, the bone surrounds it becomes stronger. So this, there is a joint there. How do you know? Because when somebody says bone on bone, they're not able to stand, walk, it's fused. And this person can walk, a little bit of discomfort, but they can bend it, no discomfort at all, and sit down. So I said, dear, it's not bone on bone, tell you that much, okay? Now, this is some of the things that you have to do to correct it. You've got to correct the physical, chemical, emotional stress, but you have a pump on the back of the leg. You've got to stretch that calf. If you have altered mechanics, okay, like high-heeled shoes, that's going to throw the pelvis off. But there's no way I'm going to tell um, people that are, are like, like being taller, okay, I love you, dear, <laughs> to not wear high heels, okay? But, you know, they're not going to wear it 24-7. My mom, we actually had to buy her high heel tennis shoes because she was a you know, 40s glamour girl. But you've got to, you know, you know, alter the mechanics of the foot. So make sure that the foot, you're walking barefoot in the grass. You're doing the calf stretch. And you don't want to stand on a staircase because that's tightening up the muscle. You want a passive stretch. That's why we pass out these little 4x4 four four blocks. This one is one of the best exercises ever. Um, but you have to have a trochanter support on. You've got to stabilize the pelvis. You stand on a little block, 10-pound weight. This is, this is my wife. She's only, um, oh, wait, I almost said 4'11", because she's 4'11", but she wants to think she's 5 foot. So I should say she's 5 foot. <laughs> so when you're swinging this, you're seeing there's not a lot of movement there. So the heel, when the foot comes forward, is level with the toe. The toe is level with the heel. But what happens with a lot of people in, in, with hip damage is they learn to compensate for the motion. So I'll have husbands sit down there and hold the pelvis because you know those, those like birds that, that sit on desks that go like this? That's what people end up look like they're doing. They move the leg back and they move like, yeah, I'm moving my hip, perfect. No, you're not, no, you're not, okay. So stabilize the pelvis and isolate it so it will pull open. And think what this does. Opens up that joint, creating a negative pressure, allowing fluid to flow into that joint, okay? It's also stabilizing the opposite side, so it's going to be taking some weight off of that. So you're firing off, like since she's working on the left leg, the right gluteus meat or the, is going to be firing off to stabilize it and shift the weight over. On sitting, foam piece, fantastic, water bottle, anything at the junction, the bottom of the elbow is where the bottom of that goes. 20 minutes in, 10 minutes out, 20 minutes in, 10 minutes out. It takes 20 minutes of consistent pressure in order to have the body accept that new change. Hugely important. This is one of the worst exercises you can do, okay, because the discs in a low back, when you're standing and in a normal configuration, they're narrow at the back, wide at the front, and that leaves a nice room for the nerves. Now watch what happens to the holes when I flatten this out. Oh, the holes open up. Oh my gosh, that feels so good. Oh my gosh, look at what we just did to the discs. Now they're wide at the back, narrow at the front. Okay, so if you want to be stuck in this body position, because you've seen people walking around like this, they do that because they're opening up the holes where the nerves come out. They're called the intervertebral foramen. And that feels better, but you're actually doing damage. 
Now, the Cobra exercise, and this, you create a negative pressure on the front, but it's gonna be modified. In a Cobra, you go all the way back and arch up. Okay, this one, you use the strength of your arms to create a negative pressure on the front part, you're getting the curve back, but where your belt is, act like that's bolted down on the ground, okay? So you're only isolating the lumbar. You're just doing gentle, gentle presses. Now this one's gotta be done under the direction of a chiropractor. Because if your disc is on the back half of that opening where the nerve is, you're gonna have the first one's gonna hurt, the second time you're gonna do it, it's gonna hurt worse, the third's gonna do it worse. Stop, okay? If it hurts, it's not good. Okay, the chiropractor can separate the joints, put that disc back in place so you'll be able to do it, and then you have an effective exercise. More exercises, the ball exercises are fantastic. Moving that hip and pelvis are gonna be amazing because this helps correct the biomechanics that you've had for walking with a messed up hip. And this gal here, fan, <laughs> she is so cool, okay? Um, belly dancer. Okay, and she is just amazing, dynamic, and you can see before and after, and we actually have, I put a red line there to try and show you what the back half of the joint looks like, how her joints, and you know, it had to do with the trauma. You can see the lumbar before had that, where it comes up and goes off to the side. Okay, that means she's had compromised nerve supply to it but she is doing splits, she's doing stuff that, that anyone can do. Yeah. But the joint still is not completely normal because it never was, it never was. Joints are hydraulic, you need fluid in them. Here's another one. I'm trying to use a red line to, to draw it in there and I, I must have an old program because I've seen some people draw them with a pencil but I can't do that on my computer but that's kind of what the back half of the joint looks like. And you can see the entire hip is completely distorted. But this person also had knee issues. And the knee issues were also affecting how she was walking. But again, she's gonna have 100% recovery. You know, it's, it's cool because the joints still move. We found compromised nerve supply, compromised blood supply, and this is the key. If you have a damaged joint, and that damaged joint is from trauma, and you have compromised blood supply, nerve supply, or biomechanics, are you gonna need a hip replacement? Maybe, maybe. I've seen five people in 25 years that needed a hip replacement. Okay, but if you restore the blood supply, get the blood healthy, you get the, the body in a healthy tissue regenerative state, you restore the biomechanics, you stabilize the pelvis, and, and restore the nerve supply, so you're fixing the mechanical distortion, the vascular problem, and the nerve supply, guess what? You got a good chance that that hip will be saved. Okay, that's it. And if you do that, and you still can't save the hip, you fix the actual problem, so at least now the prosthetic hip has a better chance to last. Okay, and is that too much common sense? That's why we're not on CNN. Okay, so things to not do, okay? <laughs> Uh, no hip rehab without correcting the foot and biomechanics. You've got to look at the whole body as holistic. It's called holistic. It's just common sense. No hip rehab without lumbar and pelvic corrections. The hip is just the alarm, not the real problem. You've got to correct the pelvic instability. And no ice on chronic hip injuries. That means you put heat on there. Why? Because you put heat that rushes blood supply to the joint. What are joints? They're all hydraulic. Eliminate prescription drugs that reduce the body's ability to heal. Yeah. Uh, does that seem complicated? Okay, I would put in there, if a doctor is giving you drugs that alter how your body regenerates itself, that's probably not a good doctor. No, don't say duh. <laughs> okay, and this is what you gotta do, this is what we do. You gotta get a full set of x-rays, and I'm talking neck, thoracic, lumbar, pelvic areas, if someone comes in with a hip, because this is gonna affect the entire body. Once the pelvis and lumbar are restored, then you can start on hip exercises. And then the reason is because you don't want to start exercising something if you've got compromised blood supply, nerve supply, and then you say, okay, go work it out. That's not going to work real well. Balance the foot and calf exercises with lumbar and pelvic restoration. Get supplements, nutrition. Eliminate the prescriptions that are toxic to tissue regeneration. Deep sleep, because that's literally how the body works. And I don't want you hurt. 
So look at the natural stuff that you can do. Green veggie juice, turmeric, blueberries, sweet potatoes, broccoli, cruciferous vegetables, uh, pineapple, papaya. These are all antioxidants that help the body's inflammation work better. You need to have healthy blood, so eliminate the polyunsaturated fats. Um, you're looking at sesame oil, pumpkin seed, canola oil, safflower oil. Those are not good oils to help the blood healthy. Uh, vegetable oils constrict blood vessels, increase the stickiness of platelets. It means that the, the blood's not healthy because these are all hydraulic joints. Optimize the gut flora. Juicing, blending, fermented foods, and this is just, again, you're fixing the hip. It's actually a tissue production problem. It's not just a hip issue. So when we put this up, proper nerve supply, regular exercise, proper nutrition, sufficient rest, it makes sense, doesn't it? And that's what you got to do. You know, look at the body. Giving you symptoms has a reason. Joints do not wear out, but they do have altered mechanics. So now we're going to get into some censored stuff. Okay, so if you're on YouTube and Facebook, God bless you. And I'll see you next week for, I think we're going to do brain stuff next week. Um, like how to generate neurons in the brain. Um, but now we're going to go into the area where the disinformation board would probably, you know, send us directly over. We'd be the first one at the FEMA camp. Um, so God bless you, and I'll see you later. But those on the Dr. BVI.